Good morning and welcome to the service of worship at University United Methodist Church where we are all guests together in God's house. I want to thank you who are members who are wearing your name tags. It's a wonderful sign of hospitality to folks who are visiting if you're wearing name tags and can kind of show others what your name is so we can encourage one another to be introduced and to get to know one another by name. The name tags, of course, are at each entrance to the church and wherever you want to keep them during the week to pick them up each Sunday. There are many announcements that are in our bulletin. I hope you'll read through them. Some of the events are upcoming. We, of course, have Handbell Camp and we have a Family Day at Camp Chestnut Ridge upcoming as well. I hope if any of these uh, pertain specifically to you or your family that you'll read the details in the bulletin. We're a church that's called to love God, to serve others, and to build Christian community. Our calling, our mission is grounded in our worship. I invite us now to take a few moments and prepare our hearts as we worship the Lord. gracious and merciful. The Lord is good to all.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. This morning and every morning, we know your true love and provision for our daily needs, O oh God. This morning, we join our voices in praise and prayer, publicly proclaiming our gratitude and invoking your continued care of us in body, mind, and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Invite us now to a time of silent confession. Hear the good news. In the right time, when we were weak, when we were yet sinners, God sent his Son that we would know we are forever loved and eternally forgiven. In the grace of God, we are forgiven. Amen. Please join for the prayer for elimination found in your bulletin. Living Lord, strip our hearts of strife, breathe into us your breath of life, that we may follow your Spirit's way with justice and love, this and every day. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is one of the strangest and most mysterious stories in the Bible. Alone at the ford of the Jabbok River, which is now on the border of Israel and Jordan, the patriarch Jacob prevails in a wrestling match. Although the passage is usually entitled, Jacob Wrestles with the Angel, no angel is mentioned. Rather, Jacob's opponent is called a man. Throughout the Old Testament, however, angels do look like men. After the wrestling is over and the man or angel has vanished, Jacob says that he has seen the face of God. Jacob names the place Peniel, which means face of God in Hebrew. The man or angel, or is it God, blesses Jacob and gives him a new name, Israel which means in Hebrew, he who strives with God. Hear the words of this intriguing story from Genesis 32, 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip and socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, 
for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord.
you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The gospel lesson is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. This, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there and went to a deserted place. What Jesus had heard was the tragic news that John the Baptist was dead. He had been murdered by Herod Antipas, the scoundrel son of a scoundrel king. He was the son of the so-called Herod the Great, slaughterer of children. And Herod Antipas, too, was well-schooled in the politics of death. And so at the start of today's scripture, we meet a community reeling in the wake of a horrific murder. A community not unlike our own, still wondering how it is that a beloved professor could go for an afternoon walk and never return. The people of Galilee had gone to bed that night with the usual amount of sorrow and grief that hung over the lives of first century Jews. Over time, they had resigned themselves to being unwilling victims of a political system that did not have their best interests at heart. With practice, they had willed themselves not to see the economic disparity between rich and poor. In the face of relentless tension between religious sects, they sighed and they separated themselves as best they could. And when people died from this or that fatal disease, they learned to weep less and less. But this morning, the news is simply too much for them. John the Baptist, dead? His head served on a platter as casually as a bowl of olives? And so the men stream out of their houses, 5,000 strong, and the women, their hands still sticky from kneading the morning bread, leave it unbaked and follow their husbands and their sons and their brothers seeking this Jesus of Nazareth. The children were tagging along, and you know children, they were probably laughing and giggling at this unexpected trip to the lake shore. But then they saw a clenched jaw there and a stream of tears here. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Could Jesus be the physician they were looking for? Jesus sees the crowds gathering and he loves them. He sees a people searching for truth for health, peace of mind, spiritual nourishment, and he heals them all day long. He cures what ails them. The sun reaches high overhead and he continues to heal. 
The time for supper comes and goes, and he continues to heal. As the sun sinks in the horizon, the disciples elbow their way through this undulating crowd of more than 5,000. And above the roar of the crowds, they shout to Jesus, the Lord of the cosmos, a line that would be hilarious if only we didn't say it so often ourselves. Jesus, this place, it's deserted, and the hour is far too late. How often in the midst of tragedy, or even garden variety sorrow, do we, like the disciples, think we walk in a deserted place? A marriage ends and we say, God, where were you? The doctor calls and we say to the Holy Spirit, don't even bother to show up. The hour is too late. We lose a job, fail a test, say goodbye to a loved one. And with blinders firmly in place, we cry out, Jesus, we have nothing. When we succumb to the illusion that we walk in a deserted place, it's all too easy to grasp at anything to fill that void. I know earlier in my life I tried to fill it by moving to a smaller house to simplify, and when that didn't work, I moved to a bigger house to complicate, I guess. I took up gardening, I raised chickens, I ate local. None of these are bad in and of themselves, unless we go and examine what the motives might be for doing them. What do you do to fill the void in the deserted places? Buy stuff? Dream of being somewhere else? Spend hours online? Nurse a limitless ambition for yourself or for your children? Jesus, like a parent, exposes our flair for drama. We cry out, we have nothing! And he stands silent until we squirm and admit, well, Nothing except these loaves and these fish. Bring them to me, he says. And then in a great show of love and compassion for all who hunger, he demonstrates the mystical power of serving spiritual food in his name. In actions that are familiar to all of us, Jesus holds the bread and he holds it up to heaven to acknowledge the one who is the source of all our bread. And then he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to the disciples. And then, in a surprising twist to the liturgy, he says to us, now you feed them. And like Israel, wandering in the wilderness, looking upward to catch flaky bits of manna, the bread of angels, on their tongue, the people of Galilee received their fill, and they are satisfied. And when all had eaten, there were still twelve baskets left over. You feed them. What an awesome responsibility that we have been entrusted with. Most Bibles call this story, Jesus Feeds the 5,000. But not only are there far more than 5,000 once you count the women and the children, but Jesus isn't the one to feed them. Of course, he is the bread of life. He is there in the bread, but he assigns the task of spreading the bread to the world to us. Some of you may be thinking, well, feeding people, that's not too bad. I already donate food to table. When I'm at the grocery store, I throw an extra bag of rice into the cart. I go to uh, feed the homeless on Thanksgiving and every third Tuesday. All of these are wonderful. Don't stop doing those things. But don't be fooled into thinking that this is all that Jesus means when he says, you feed them. Jesus didn't meet the crowds on the lake shore simply to sponsor their dinner. He didn't meet them solely to heal their bodies. He knew well the pain of living in a broken world, and so he came to nourish their souls. After all, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Our very existence rests on that word. 
outside these walls and inside them too, are people like the crowds in Galilee who hunger for a word of hope. Being the ones charged with feeding them can be a terrifying proposition. Believe me, I know, you may not have noticed, but I am not the same age as my colleagues who just graduated from Divinity School. I am not 26. It took me a good, long time to stand up before people like you and talk about God with anything other than fear and trembling. By the time I really heard God's call on my life, I wasn't new to the church. I had attended church my whole life. But still, I found it easy to confine God to Sundays. But slowly and surely, year after year of spiritual formation, Luke 9.23 started to haunt me. It says this, then Jesus said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow me. What could that mean? What could that really mean? I wondered. I began to want to do more, but I wasn't sure, practically speaking, what God meant for me to do. So I began to pray, Lord, how do you want me to serve you? I was on a spiritual retreat when I finally realized why I hadn't heard God's response. You see, I thought I had been praying, Lord, how do you want me to serve you? But what I had really been asking was, how do you want me to serve you that won't affect my life? that won't affect my husband, my children, my bank account? These aren't the same questions. And so it was that when I found myself at a retreat listening to a pastor tell her story of being called to ordain ministry, Jesus' words to Peter started to play constantly in my mind, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. A few days later, I applied to seminary. Now, some of you look a little worried. I know not everyone is called to ordain ministry. Not all of you need to go to seminary. But all of us are called to feed those who hunger for hope in a world that feels broken. But we can't feed others if we ourselves are starving for spiritual food. We can't share God's love with others if we really don't know deep in our heart God's love for us. For most people, such understanding and nourishment takes effort. And as your pastor of spiritual formation, my passion in life is helping you develop intentional practices that deepen your knowledge and love of God. And to do that, I need your input. While you have been sitting here worshiping today, an email has drifted through cyberspace and landed in your email box. And if you haven't received it by this afternoon, you can look on the member page of our church website and you can find it there. The purpose of this survey is to help me and others plan short-term uh, and, and long-term studies and Sunday schools to help you grow spiritually. I need to know, how is it that you connect with God? How can the Holy Spirit work through me and the discipleship team to help you connect with God? Do you connect with God through art, through studying music, through gardening, silence, history? There are so many ways we can come to know God. And if you tell me how that is, then I will try to help you do that. Your anonymous resp responses will help us help you. And if you have a smartphone, you can even fill out the survey while you wait for lunch today. Free love and other gospel truths. That's the sermon series that we're in. And so I stand before you today to proclaim this truth. This I know for sure. This is not a deserted place. The hour is not too late. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we have far more than nothing. We have everything.
This is the news that crowds hunger to hear, and now let us all join together and feed them. In the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, amen. Join together in the affirmation of faith that's printed in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you formed us from the beginning, made us in your image and call us good, and wherever we go, you make a way for there to be good things to grow out of even the darkest of places. Grant, O oh God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, Live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. The 
Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We continue to think about the children who are going back to school this fall, and some of which who have already gone back to school, and those especially that do not have enough food over the weekends um, or enough school supplies as they return. We also lift up those throughout the world who are in the midst of conflict, praying for the people in Gaza and the conflict there and also in Ukraine and all other places in the world where war and violence are continued presence. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly and in the service of others, to your honor and your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked to ours, praying for the joy of new life and expecting mothers in our midst, as for the birth of Owen Timothy Brinson and his parents, Betsy and Dwayne. And we lift up all who may not have the joy of new life and those who are struggling with loneliness or the trouble of difficult relationships. We grant that through your hospitality, we may provide gentleness and serve others and love them as you also have loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them your hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. And this morning we think especially of Ron Gonya who is recovering from a heart attack and also of Sharon Rich's father, Wes Holly, and Jordan Renner who's recovering from burns on his foot. And all those we know who are ailing and everyone throughout West Africa in the midst of the Ebola crisis. May your spirit bring wisdom, strength, comfort, and healing where it is needed most. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up all who have died and give them to your loving care. And we pray that your will for them may be fulfilled and that we may also share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. God, you know the words on our hearts, those spoken and unspoken, and we lift them to you and trust that you love us freely, all of us where we are here in this place. And we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is good and all the time. This day, as we continue to worship, I invite you, if you're sitting near the center aisle, if you'll look in your pew and find the black fellowship pad that's there, 
And if you'll sign that pad and pass it down the pew, and those of you at the end, if you'll pass it back again so that we can greet one another by name at the end of our service as we pass the peace of Christ. And I know that uh, many of us carry uh, prayer concerns on our hearts. I hope you'll look in the pews for the yellow prayer cards and sign those and place them in the collection plate this week so that we can pray with you and for you in the weeks ahead. And this morning there is an insert in your bulletin concerning the Golden Rule. Every year our Golden Rule rally is a, an opportunity for us to collect school supplies for students in our public schools. I hope you'll do that and I hope you'll read the details of this insert even more closely because we are building on our efforts from last year. In addition to helping students with school supplies, last year during the spring semester this congregation fed 50 children in the public schools nearby who did not have food over the weekends at home. Table is a wonderful program that we support that sends food home on the weekends with children who don't have the means to have food at home. They rely on subsidized meals during the week at school. The summertime is a particularly difficult time for those folks. More than one in four children in Orange County do not have sufficient support and food at home. More than one in four are on subsidized lunch in our public schools. This year with Golden Rule, we are collecting school supplies for these students, but we're also collecting support for food. I hope you'll read the details of this and participate to get school supplies and also backpacks. These kids are in such need that they go through two, sometimes three backpacks in a year. That's because every Friday they carry home not only their heavy books, but also food for the family for the weekend. And that takes a toll on a cheap backpack. Let us feed them. Let us feed all those in need that we can reach and help. $10 each weekend feeds one student. That's $40 a month. That's $400 for one student for the year. I share those numbers simply to give you a reference point as we follow God's leading and we, in the tradition of Methodists everywhere, care for those in our community. Let us continue to worship the Lord by giving to God God's tithes, our offerings, and our very selves.
the hungry, and go with the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of the Lord be with you.